All right, and this should be a pretty simple follow-up video to the uh, PBR primer I did not too long ago. And this is basically focused on these three applications that are used to create PBR textures. And sure, you can use Photoshop and go in there and mess with the metal in this channel and all that stuff, but I think once you see what these uh, applications have to offer, you're going to be on board here 100%. So the three main software applications that you can use to create PBR is Quixel Suites, which is their DDR and NDR uh, applications. And there's 3D Coat, which I don't have much experience with, and there's Substance Painter. Now, unfortunately, they haven't updated uh, Quixel Suites in quite a while, so I don't recommend them unless they do put out some type of update or actually commit that they're actually still going to be supporting that software package. So in the last couple of weeks, I have been learning Substance Painter, and it's a phenomenal application, so I highly recommend it. This video is not going to be here to teach you how to use it. There's plenty of uh, videos on YouTube showing that, and also from the manufacturer themselves. And so I just kind of want to show you how it's kind of used to create PBR uh, textures and how it inserts into the workflow. Now if you can see uh, in the background here, this is my CV. This is a product that I released about five years ago, and I'm updating it to the PBR standard. And this is the general layout. If you are familiar with Photoshop, you're going to be very familiar with everything in Substance Painter. They model their 3D interface and everything very much off of Photoshop. So if you look here, you've got your tools on the left hand, just like Photoshop. Here you have your asset list, and then here you have the layers, and also the properties. Uh, this is called the shelf, and this is basically a, a kind of a get-all to where all your tools and all your textures you know, are going to be located in here. And I'll show you how to use that a little bit later. But uh, the... Uh, interface is pretty simple. Uh, it uses the control layout just like uh, um, Maya. So if you're familiar with 3D Studios Max, it may be a little bit different, but it doesn't take that much to get used to. Um, if we zoom in here, you can see I've already done quite a bit of work. I've created a base aluminum texture shader, and I've also created some normal map rivets and panel lines. Now, this shader, if you look here, you can see that in uh, the crevices and stuff, there's dirt, there's a lot of differences within the surface itself of the reflectivity, uh, even some, a little bit of a noise in here, and it looks really good. And this was actually a very simple shader to create once you get to know the basics. And I'll go ahead and show you the little, deconstruct the uh, material here for you. Now, you can see here at the base layer, uh, you can change the reflectiveness of it. The metallic, of course, is 100%. And here you can change how reflective it is right here. You can come on up here and get really nice and shiny. And then you can still see that there's all this other dirt still underneath this you know, base layer. And that is the layering system that I was talking about. That's very much like Photoshop. So everything above that base layer changes the look of things based on masking. So if you he look here, here's the dirt. If I remove this layer, this kind of removes a lot of the general dirt and surface crime here. You can see it right here in the reflection if I turn this layer off. Uh, the next layer is the angle occlusion dirt, which is going to be this dirt which is in the crevices. If I turn that off, you can see that that dirt uh, turns on and off. And that whole mask right here is controlled through this generator that looks at the curvatures, it looks at the ambient occlusion, it looks at a whole bunch of different factors and figures out where dirt should be that right there should blow your mind. If it doesn't, I don't know what will. But this is basically going to dirty up the aircraft for you. You don't have to sit here and go, okay, well, I need to paint a little bit of dirt here. I need to paint a little bit of dirt here. This is pretty much going to find out, find all those crevices that are going to be hard to clean and put dirt in there. And it's also going to affect, uh, if you want to, it'll affect the height map, it'll affect the 
the uh, the reflection that'll ref uh, it'll affect the normal map. It'll affect as much as you want. Right here, you can see it affects the uh, reflection level because a dirty surface is not going to reflect as much as a clean surface. So you can see right here that these surfaces that are occluded in the ambient occlusion are dirty. And if I go over here to the mask layer, you can actually see that in action right here. Uh, we can see some surface grunge here. If I take this off, you can see it again. All these channels add a little bit to creating the hole. And once you get all these channels set up and uh, a, a nice working, very complex material, then that whole thing can be used to create what's called a smart material. A smart material is a collection of these layers that interact with each other to create this whole thing. And uh, once you get a base aluminum, you create the smart material and you put it down here. Uh, and you can see I already created an aluminum based material. Another interesting thing you can do is you can see here that this aircraft is divided into three pieces. We got the body one, body two, and the wings. And what I can do is instance this material across the entire project. So I don't have to sit there and go into the body and change the material and then make the same materials in the wings and the body too. If I make changes to one of these instances, let's go to the uh, body, which is the original instance. If I make changes to, let's say, I want to go into this dirt here and I want to increase the level of dirt, which is right here. This is going to add a lot of dirt, so just let it do its thing. And you can see right there that it actually affected across the entire model, all three pieces instead of just the one. And so that is, again, saving you a lot of work. It may seem like a lot of work on the front end of creating this material and creating this smart material. But once you have it set, this material can be applied to all future projects. It can be applied to all surfaces. Just think about that for a little bit. That's why I like working with the tools like this, working procedurally, is that once you get something set and something you really like, you save that as a smart material and you can use it on later projects. You can even you know, add to it once you learn the, the, the tools a little bit better. You can add detail to it. So stuff like this normal map here, these rivets and these panel lines, we can add that into the uh, aluminum to take into account so the dirt starts to gather within these little crevices of the panel lines and the rivets. And then once I do that on one of, one of the smart materials, it'll transfer into the rest of the smart materials that are instanced to it. So it's a great time consumer, not a, well, yeah, it kind of is a great time consumer, but it's a great time saver at the end. So let's go ahead and return the uh, level of dirt back to a normal area. All right, and that's looking a lot better. Uh, and so that is basically what a smart material is. It's this collection of all these different shaders in this stack. So you can see this is an instance and it's also applied to all three other pieces. But there's also tools that we can create. So if I go over here to my rivet, you can see there is a paint brush here. And I'll go into my tools and I've already created a couple of tools for myself, which is this panel lines rivet tools and a different panel line. Well, let's go ahead and go to the rivet tool and this is how I was able to paint all the rivets on this aircraft. As you can see that I have this tool already set up. It took me a couple hours to set up this tool but once it's set up I can use that on all future projects. And you can see right here all I have to do is paint rivets. I mean this is just mind-blowing. Uh, I can just do like click here once, hit shift, click over there and I have a rivet line. It is once everything is set up, it is so fast and so easy. And also, future projects are going to be able to use this tool set. So, if you look here, I'm going to go ahead and set the mirror up right here. And you can see it puts a uh, line right down the middle. And I can sit here and go, okay, I want rivet right here 
to here and it put rivets in there and it also put it on the other side because it's mirroring whatever I do on the other side. This is an amazing time saver once you have everything set up. Let's put a line of rivets there and then look over there. It's already set. So there's also other tools like these screws here. Here, let's go ahead and lower that size. Let's lower the spacing. We'll increase the spacing a little bit. We don't want too many of these screws. But let's put them on the wing. So oh, let's select the wing first. And then we can just put screws on the wings. I mean, it's really that simple once everything starts to get set up. Now you can see right here the texture resolution is a little bit low because I'm working at a 2K resolution. And I can go ahead and move this over and increase the uh, wing to a 4K resolution. It'll take, it it's just takes a little bit more time to work at a high resolution like this. That's why I drop it down to 2K. But now that it's a 4K resolution, look at this detail. It's incredible. Let's go ahead and undo that. Undo that. And then, um, so that's pretty much why these tools are so important to the PBR process is that it's going to take a little bit of time in the front end of learning the tools, of creating the shader systems, of creating the tool sets. But once you have the shaders and once you have the tools, the next project is going to get faster and look better and the next project faster and better. This opens up a lot of doors to creating much better projects in the future. So that should give you a really good example of why I believe that these tools are so important to the flight sending community and really deserve a spot in your workflow. I'm really looking forward to what comes out of some of the talented members of the flight sim community with these great tools. If you need any for more information or if you want to see video tutorials on how to use these uh, applications, I'm going to go ahead and put some links in the description below and uh, have fun.